So welcome to the third and last roundtable of the cycle of web events about the campaigns against gender ideology. This cycle was promoted by the working group GPS SESH, group of research on sexualities and organized by Teresa Taldi, Mafalda Esteves, Gustavo Welps, Pedro Fidalgo and myself. This cycle was inaugurated in February 2022 with a seminar with David Paternotte with the title Victor Frankenstein and its monster, the many lives of gender ideology. In May, we had a roundtable about the situation in the European Union, resisting the campaigns against gender ideology, activism across Europe. Our guests were Bea Sandor, Daniela Filippinto, Camille Matsuga, and Marc Angel. Then in July, we had a second round table, this time about Latin America, with Maria Amelia Viteri, José Fernández Serrano Mayo, Gabriela Arguedas Ramírez, Roger Raup Rios, and Mirta Oragas. Our initial plan was to have an opening seminar and two round tables. But then we thought that it would make sense to broaden the discussion to other parts of the world. As we know, the Vatican played and still plays a key role in the attacks against gender ideology. Actually, the negative understanding of the terminology gender ideology was invented by the Catholic Church as a way of confronting the emergency of the discussions around women's rights, reproductive rights, abortion, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and educational programs that include gender topics. Hence, a significant part of the research about the mobilizations against gender ideology engages with the Catholic Church, Catholic conservative actors, and countries where Catholicism has been traditionally the, the religion of the majority of the population, for instance, Spain, Poland, Croatia, and so on. Nonetheless, there is as well a significant body of literature that examines the role of other branches of Christianism in the moral panic about gender ideology, namely Orthodox churches, for instance, in Russia, and the role of the evangelicals in Latin America, for example, in Brazil. Considering the strong presence of the Catholic Church in other parts of the world, and the fact that we can identify quite clearly coordinated efforts by the Vatican to oppose gender ideology, it should be no surprise that the repercussions of the campaigns against gender ideology are present beyond Europe and Latin America. The concepts gender ideology and anti-genderism are present in research about other regions of the world. However, what motivated us to organize the third round table was not so much the dissemination of particular concepts, but rather the presence of particular social tendencies. As we know, the anatomy gender ideology can be defined as a key conservative rhetorical strategy to attack LGBTQ rights, feminist agendas in areas such as contraception, and scholarship that deconstructs essentialist assumptions about gender and sexuality. This phenomena, however, namely the attacks on LGBTQ rights and women's rights, are perceptible in different parts of the world without being articulated naturally around the concept of gender ideology. Therefore, we thought that it would make sense to invite scholars and activists from other parts of the world, including regions where Christianism is not the religion of the majority, to discuss these issues. Are gender and gender ideology articulated in, in the countries of our guests to oppose LGBTQ rights and women's rights? Are there parallels and convergences between mobilizations against women's and LGBTQ rights in these countries and the European and Latin American campaigns against gender ideology? And most important, which are the global possibilities of solidarity and resistance against the increasing influence of anti-gender groups and politician, politicians? Before welcoming our guests, I would like to call your attention to the next event organized by GPS SESH. I'm referring to the seminar with Na Na Daniela Fernandez-Perez from Academia to the Public, 
researching and transferring the history of sexual dissidents in Galicia, Spain. The seminar will be on September the 2nd at 4 p.m. at Serge Alta, Room 2, and you are all welcome. Now, let me welcome our guests on behalf of GPS. I would like to thank Alia, Bilda, and Siran for accepting our invitation. We know that your countries are going through difficult moments. Uh, I think about the floods in Pakistan and the war in Eastern Armenia. And we thank you very much for being here in spite of the anxiety around these situations. Now, Teresa Toldi is going to present our three guests. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here. So I want at first to greet everybody and especially our guests, of course. So today we will hear Alia Amirali. Uh, she's a political worker based in Pakistan and associated with the left-wing Awami Workers' Party. Alia has worked closely with various grassroots movements in Pakistan over the last two decades and contributed to mobilizing students, workers, women, slum dwellers and landless tenants in various parts of the country. She's also a feminist scholar teaching gender studies at Kaivizam University in Islamabad. She's currently pursuing her PhD in gender studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science in UK. Then we will hear Bilga Yavanchi. She's a Marie Curie Fellow at Northwestern University in the United States and Carfoscar University of Venice in Italy. She researches social movements and the transfer transformation of civil society and civic space and their autocratization, especially focusing on women's organizations. She conducted, conducted extensive fieldwork on women's organizations covering cooptation and resistance dynamics within civil society. Her research also extends into populism, the populism religion nationalism relationship and the role of effect and performance in political mobilization. Previously, she was Open Society Fellow as a part of the Human Rights Cohort and the Swedish Institute Postdoctoral Fellow. At last, we will have Siren of Anjasan. I hope to get the name was well, at least Siren was <laughs> correct, from Women's Fund Armenia and the Center for Gender and Leadership Studies of Yerevan State University. Siren combines her interests in research in both academia and gender policy together with the consultancy affiliations with local and international organizations. She holds two master's degrees in social work from Yerevan, Yerevan State University and in gender studies from Central European University. Siran is actively involved in studying multi-level expressions of anti-genderism and their impact on feminist movements in Armenia and other post-socialist countries in comparative perspectives. So Alia, Bilga and Siran will now make their presentations. Alia, Bilga and Siran, thank you so much again for accepting our invitation. It is an honor to have you here with us so please, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Teresa. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be here um, in large part because I don't get to interact with people from these parts of the world much. So it is really a, a pleasure and an honor um, to be invited to this. Um, so I'd like to, to begin um, by speaking to how I understand uh, the terms anti-genderism and gender ideology. Um, and I speak as a, a cisgendered class privileged woman from Pakistan, uh, which is a deeply and violently patriarchal country. Um, I don't know how familiar you are, any of you are with Pakistan, but I suppose Pakistan is not unique in that sense, but uh, Yes, I'm also, I also speak as a Marxist feminist political organizer who has been engaged with various working class communities and social movements in Pakistan for about two decades. Um, 
So based on both what I've read, uh, as well as what I've experienced, I associate the term gender ideology with an ideology of separation, uh, of differentiation and classification, which historically accompanies the distinctions of race, caste, and class as the process of capitalist and colonial expansion and accumulation envelop more and more of the world. So if it were up to me, I would choose to use gender ideology or genderism to actually refer to that which we are subjected to rather than what we ourselves offer uh, or strive for. However, um, I can understand that the way that many people use this term, uh, which includes, I think, the, the organizers of this discussion, um, many people use this term in, in the ways that they use it. It's imbued with a feminist uh, and a liberatory essence. And so I too will use the term anti-gender uh, here and now in the same spirit. And hence I un will understand anti-gender attacks as political, economic, cultural, and physical attacks on women and trans people who, you know, despite being referred to as minorities, um, constitute roughly half or possibly more of the people of the world. Um, so about Pakistan now, Pakistan is seen in much of the world as a country of religious fundamentalists. Uh, and so I think it is important for an audience such as yourselves to know that at least in the Pakistani context, uh, but probably true more generally also, that while anti-gender attacks might find their most overt and physically violent expression in the actions of right-wing religious groups and individuals, of which there are certainly very many, it is not just religious groups who are right-wing. Indeed, if we are to understand right-wing forces to include all those who are anti-people in the sense that they pit people against one another, promote exclusionary ideologies and breed a politics of hate, then it would be pertinent to note that the ground for the growing anti-gender attacks in my context is prepared by purportedly democratic governments, which includes the former Imran Khan Pakistani government, as well as the current coalition government in Pakistan led by what was then the so-called opposition, all of whom we've seen in power over the years, playing musical chairs with each other in a bid to decide whose turn is next, and knowing full well that the country's military, which remains the hegemonic political actor, is in control of the music in that game. In my view, mainstream political parties in Pakistan uh, differ only to the extent of their self-presentation in terms of which populations and discourses they seek to identify with, but none have an economic program that has a credible analysis or offers solutions to its deepening economic crises. Mainstream politicians across party lines regularly use religious rhetoric, which is often sectarian and hence dangerously divisive, as well as overtly misogynistic discourse to bolster their political credentials. And finally, uh, no small part has been played by so-called secular uh, neoliberal organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, whose policies entrench the country's indebtedness, dependence, and subservience to the so-called free market and its beneficiaries. And so it is the continuous material immiseration of the many and widening inequality within Pakistani society, which have sown the seeds of social unrest much of which finds its expression in reactionary and even violent forms, such as the attacks on the Aurat Azadi marches, which translates to the Women's Liberation Marches, that take place on 8th March International Women's Day every year. It is no surprise then that the organizers of these marches were slapped with entirely fabricated charges of blasphemy which uh, is a life-threatening charge in the Pakistani context. We were dragged through courts across the country for months with political figures, both within and outside government, and even sympathizers unwilling to come out publicly in our defense. In such circumstances, 
uh, it was in fact a blessing to be dragged through courts and not through the streets by a mob, has, as has been the fate of many before us. The recent floods in Pakistan are, are a good example of how the solutions proposed for the colossal destruction of lands, livelihoods, and life um, are woefully inadequate and possibly threaten rather than secure the future of our peoples. Over 30 million people have been affected by, and this is by conservative estimates. More than one third of the country was submerged in water uh, in a country that is home to over 221 million people due to unprecedented floods induced by climate change. Mega water projects pushed and funded by the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank have greatly exacerbated the damage done induced by climate change. The potential dangers of building these projects were persistently brought up by local communities, including women, but were paid no heed. And now these very development agencies are promising to assist Pakistan in the flood rehabilitation efforts. Um, and uh, the, the, the scary part is that in their assistance um, uh, that they're offering to Pakistan, there's apparently uh, no reflection on their dangerous obsession with mega water projects. Moreover, the key question of what happens to Pakistan's economy as a result of this assistance looms even larger than before. The last thing that Pakistan can afford is to be buried under even more debt, which is the modus operandi of donor assistance to Pakistan and all third world countries. The calls for climate reparations and reduction, not even cancellation of Pakistan's debts, have been met so far only with wishy-washy statements from the US and other global North countries. So to connect this and to bring us back to anti-gender attacks and how to counter them, in my view, anti-gender attacks are indeed on the rise, as is communal division and hatred along religious, ethnic, and sectarian lines, for which precisely the above described conditions provide a fertile breeding ground. It is worth remembering that anti-gender ideologies in the region, and so I'm talking specifically about the South Asian region right now, that these and that in this in the region, anti-gender ideologies are often legitimized in the name of resisting foreign occupation. This is exemplified best by the Taliban, who center control over women in their ideological narrative and now also in Afghan government policy. In India, an openly right-wing government has used the gendered tropes of the oppressed Muslim woman and the dangerous Muslim man to undo the secular and at least relatively democratic fabric that hitherto underlay Indian politics and society. In Pakistan, but also in many other countries, I suspect, the policy of appeasing right-wing sentiments by liberal governments while maintaining the capitalist, patriarchal, racist, and imperialist status quo is further fueling people's disaffection with policies and parties that appear to be balanced and moderate. Notably, the glaring lack of living, breathing, life-serving left alternatives to the status quo, at least in my part of the world, further emboldens the right wing and positions the politics of hate as the most accessible, meaningful, and hence in some ways the only real option available to most people. The hope for transformation, in my view, um, lies in a return to political organizing. And I use political organizing to mean, I think it can, I think political organizing can take many different forms. And we can talk about this um, hopefully later in the discussion as well. Resistance and solidarity are necessary, but not sufficient. I believe we need to move away from the fractured, fragmented ways that social movements have become embroiled in a competition of oppressions, exacerbated by the individuated nature of an increasingly digitized political sphere. I believe we need a politics that neither denies nor is consumed by difference. 
I believe we need a politics which is grounded in an acknowledgement of our mutual interdependence and strives for universal, which enables us to collaborate and to act together. An engagement with power in all of its forms, including state power and at all levels from below all the way to above, I think will be necessary um, if we are to turn the tide and give our future generations a chance at life. So I'm just going to stop there and um, yeah, mm, happy to pick up on any of these things um, in later in the discussion. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alia. Now we will hear Bilge. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for this invitation. It's really a pleasure uh, to be part of this roundtable series. Um, so my part of this uh, roundtable um, will be focused on uh, the specific case of Turkey, yet another deeply patriarchal gendered society where um, nationalism is mingled with and, and, and performed through masculine performances in everyday life. And I will try to sketch um, the current state of anti-gender mobilizations and their actions and actors. Um, but the anti-genderism in Turkey, of course, cannot be evaluated outside the context of Turkey's slow descent into autocratization over the last 10, 20 years. Because Turkey is ruled by the same political party, uh, Justice and Development Party, known by its uh, abbreviation uh, AKP, under the leadership of President Erdogan, for 20 years now, uninterruptedly. And of course, the AKP is elected through popular vote, but uh, gradually pushed for an increasingly repressive system that eroded freedom, civil society, and the rule of law, fair electoral competition. And second, this party came out of a long tradition of a lineage of conservative Islamist political scene in Turkey. And its main electoral constituency is conservative nationalists that almost preordain in several ways uh, the way that the party approaches to the gender issue. So these two factors really closely shape this local variant of anti-genderism in Turkey. And I will come back to these points to explain how. Uh, but to go to the beginning, um, AKP came to power in 2002. Uh, in Turkey. Uh, and this was a period uh, when the country was in the midst of an economic and political party crisis. And the party was a newly established and insecure one. And uh, it was in need of securing its value for a wider audience. And towards this end, it instrumentalized women's rights and gender issues. And during the early years, the Turkish government displayed a quite liberal and open stance on gender issues. Rights related to women have been improved through legal changes. The government supported women's organizations' involvement in drafting Istanbul Convention, the Council of Europe Convention. Uh, then the government promptly approved and codified it in 2012. Uh, and the government uh, representatives publicly displayed very liberal attitude towards LGBTQ communities, uh, depicting them as equal and rights-bearing agents, citizens. And during this period, different components of the women's movement in Turkey were able to access and lobby the government. Uh, however, pretty much after the codification of Istanbul Convention, the AKP shut women's organizations off from policymaking consultations. And this coincided with the period that the AKP also started to dominate the political scene as the largest party with the ability of um, unifying previously fragmented right-wing conservative and nationalist constituencies. And during this period, the government started crafting and circulating a public discourse that revolves around the concept of gender justice, a makeshift alternative to gender equality. And this gender justice uh, concept actually, actually combines some Islamic Quranic principles with some cherry-picked ideas of post-colonial feminism 
And Vatican's position on gender actually copies it. And gender justice basically defends biological differences between men and women, claiming that, of course, they are God-given. And taking this dogmatic ontological starting point, gender justice um, refers to uh, not the equality, but complementarity, uh, complementary roles of men and women, especially justifying traditional gender division of labor in society and, and family. And of course, this gender justice is claimed to be an authentic and native approach to gender relations to represent the rural Anatolian people's concerns, contrary to the alienated and assimilated feminists that represent more urban, leftist, privileged, or elite women. So the new gender policy, this new gender discourse has actually built, uh, been built at the intersections of ethno-nationalism, body politics, and neoliberalization. Religious references are clearly used to legitimate a nationalist nostalgia for the eternal strong nation, which is to be rebuilt on women's familial uh, roles. The mother and the wife or the decent women should nurture the family, the nation, and traditional values through her reproductive capacity and domestic role. And all these are actually linked to a myth about eventual national rebirth as a strong country. But all this religious and nationalist, nationalist imagination nurtures a neoliberal governance uh, and actually uh, uh, underlines uh, withdrawal of the state from social provision. Uh, women, by prioritizing, of course, domestic care roles, uh, can support the government, uh, government's withdrawal from social provision, and also enable uh, uh, part-time and precarious or temporary contracts that is based on the exploitation of labor of women. And of course, in this gender justice a principle or a concept, there is no place for sexual minorities. Um, and LGBTQ communities, they, they have been subject to increasing marginalization as a group that attack family and the nation and traditional values. And in this sense, I think Turkey is not very different from other parts of, of the world, uh, especially Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and for example, when the government announced that uh, it was withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention, uh, well, Turkey is the first country to, si to sign the convention and the first to withdraw, one of the arguments was that the agreement, the, 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 the convention was hijacked uh, by, uh, by the LGBT uh, uh, ideologues or groups uh, attempting to normalize homosexuality. Um, but it is not only about some cheap rhetoric, some discursive action, because discourse becomes quite constitutive of, of policies uh, and, and uh, alliances uh, of anti-genderism, because the AKP relies also on various actors to diffuse and implement this gender policy, this, this anti-genderist discourse. Um, the first actor towards this end is the media, of course, the, the, the diffuse conservative traditional binary gender roles. So the, the media, uh, of course, is now seized and controlled by the government in Turkey uh, as a part of this autocratization uh, process. And of course, now it seeks to promote a template image of acceptable women through TV series, reality shows, debates and discussions that women are depicted as mothers and wives um, and you know, enduring certain behavior defined through modesty, honor, tolerance, patience. Uh, another important actor is the presidency of religious affairs called uh, in Turkish Diyanet. Um, it's, it's a constitutionally secular republic. Of course, there is not an independent religious authority like church in Turkey. And the closest entity is this Diyanet, which is a state institution established in 1924 with an intent to manage and control Islam. And the state now, uh, state capture through this democratic backsliding I mentioned in the beginning is crucial here because the AKP has progressively expanded its control over the Dianet by appointing the head of the organization directly, uh, selecting from more compliant and conservative figures and marginalizing more progressive and liberal public servants from this institution. And Dianet has become a part of a large autocratic state machinery to issue religious statements to guide public about traditional family and values. 
And more importantly, for example, Diane it now appoints female preachers at women's shelters. And those shelters accommodate women who escape from domestic violence. And Diane's officials actually replaced representatives from women's organizations in those women's shelters to consult with women in line with traditionalist gendered view of family. And under the AKP rule, Diane had also established um, or strengthened what was already there, an institution called Family Guidance and Consultation Bureaus, where female pre preachers promote the government's gender vision through religious consultations, reaching out to particularly non-working women. Um, Another actor that uh, actively contributes or diffuses the government's gender uh, uh, agenda is the sector of pro-government women's organizations with close organic links to the government. And these organizations uh, have thrived and achieved a wide presence in the country with several offices across Turkey. And this extensive organizational capacity was developed in a few years and should be evaluated really against the fact that most of the established autonomous women's organizations have only one or two offices. And this pro-government wing of women's groups are of course exempt from all the bureaucratic hurdles, restrictive rules and police repression that many women's organizations face today or activists. And they are financially and politically supported and they are encouraged to have grassroots links. And, they have been close allies of the government to mobilize the public opinion in line with the new gender discourse, because they often form a counter block uh, to feminist women's organizations um, to promote the AKP's controversial public policies regarding gender equality and women's rights. They often do not uh, unconditionally support the AKP's public policies, especially if the issue is highly controversial for the public, but they seek to soften and prepare public opinion by distorting the facts or diverting public attention to minor issues. And another aspect of their engagement uh, uh, is, is their countrywide projects, such as vocational training, um, support for parents uh, of, of drug addicted children, integration programs for women refugees in Turkey now, um, aid for women living in poverty. And these projects are uh, mostly financed by ministries or AKP municipalities or state institutions. Um, they also uh, undertake an active role in shaping political attitudes. One of the most direct means of doing so is through affecting voting behavior by electioneering. Uh, so to the 2017 referendum, was the gateway for re regime change in Turkey from parliamentary system to unchecked presidential system. And those pro-government women's organizations carried out an electoral campaign arguing that the new system would liberate them. And they urged women to vote for the presidential system and their campaigns involved not only public seminars, but door-to-door -door visits for stay home women with limited access to outside world and information, especially in rural areas. In other words, by using their vast organizational network, they could tailor their campaign for more efficiency for wider audience, a very effective strategy uh, for reaching out to women from different corners uh, of, of life, from different socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. The final actor that the AKP allies with is those Islamic orders and, and brotherhoods, uh, they clearly have a much more direct and radical agenda. Uh, they can circulate without any sanction, hate speech targeting the LGBT community and feminist groups, while of course the freedom of speech is heavily repressed in Turkey. One of the recent emanations of their mobilization actually took place a few days ago on Sunday last week, and allegedly 100 uh, 50 organizations, Islamic organizations, organized a rally called Family Gathering. And in, in, in its essence, it was uh, an anti-LGBT rally, uh, the, one of the largest Turkey has ever witnessed. And thousands of people gathered in Istanbul claiming that gender ideology undermines family and children. And what is worrying is that 
those people openly called for action to prevent uh, expression or display or support in public space for LGBTQ communities to ban um, uh, what they call LGBTQ propaganda. And they made direct demands to criminalize homosexuality, which has never been a criminal act in Turkey since its establishment. They demand high penalties. Um, of course, despite the attempts to impose an anti-gender discourse uh, based on familial roles of women and body politics, there is also a new wave of feminist movement, uh, including self-defined Muslim feminists in Turkey and the vocal LGBTQ uh, uh, community. And my fieldwork insights are limited to women's organizations. So I'm not talking for the LGBTQ mobilization necessarily, but I believe there are parallels. So autonomous and oppositional women have achieved an impressive resonance and visibility, uh, even though they are excluded by the government from the policymaking processes and they often face discretionary repression. And they chose a strategy that I label in my work, uh, tactful contention. Tactful contention plays a considerable role in building internal strength and resilience for, for women's movement. And there are two discrete factors behind tactful contention. First is the choice of organization or, or the choice of organizational form. And the second one is the action repertoire. So organizational form refers to their grassroots, more flexible and horizontal networks. So activists that I talk to emphasize that to be able to remain autonomous from governmental pressure and to be able to determine their own agenda, their organization remains a loose network and relies on crowdfunding. So financial independence also allows them to be accountable to only to their uh, grassroots who collectively contribute to, to the organization. And this way they claim what they call public truth telling. And this strategy of, of, of loose organizational form has become a wise choice uh, as many NGOs, uh, formally organized or, uh, uh, NGOs, face closure and confiscation of property in the post 2016 coup period. Um, and this organizational strategy is also considered as a panacea to NGOization, which is often perceived as a, as, 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 as a co-optation uh, by, by incumbents and international donors and, and means for losing touch with the core support base. So the second factor, the, the organizational, uh, uh, the actor, the, the, the repertoire of, uh, of action uh, uh, allows autonomous women's organization to pursue a more flexible and multidimensional mobilization as an alternative to advocacy and direct lobbying and allows them to mobilize in large numbers. So they have been um, outside opportunities given to pro-government women's groups, no direct lobbying, no influence in policies or discourse. So they rely on several self-sustaining methods of mobilization and they have created an inventive repertoire of contentious action typical of social movements, protests, sit-ins, performative demonstrations, and women have progressively expanded their protests beyond femicides or sexual harassment or forced marriage uh, and started to incorporate some intersectional issues. For example, they organized demonstrations and public campaigns against the economic crisis, the constitutional referendum in 2017, uh, the recent boom in inflation. They also mobilized in support of diverse issues, including environmental justice and refugee women. And besides contentious action, they also resort to uh, off-street uh, uh, repertoire, that, that, uh, um, combining deliberative assemblies, social media campaigns, and blogging. And these multiple venues of action, combining on and off-street repertoire, provides ample opportunities for tactical switches as the intensity and target of repression really changes. Because in contexts like Turkey, where democracy is gradually dismantled, what is really cumbersome for activist communities is the unpredictability of repression rather than the presence of repression. Because the red lines ebb and flow so fast, one issue or event that was considered to be safe and tolerated can turn into a lightning rod attracting repression from the government. So capability of having more than one area of action allows them to tactically remain afloat and resilient without losing relevance. So overall in Turkey, there is a highly polarized and politicized uh, atmosphere concerning gender issues, 
Anti-genderism is very strong thanks to the fact that the government can utilize state institutions and create a divide alliance of conservative nationalist actors. But this has also created its own counter mobilization that relies on the grassroots and everyday activism. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, they will be able to uh, capitalize on several issues and mediums to remain relevant and resilient. And uh, the hope is that this could be one of the main actors in the future to return to democracy. Um, I think I will stop here and I'm happy to continue uh, during the Q&A. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Now, uh, Siram. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. And also thank you to the previous speakers for their amazing reflections and analysis. This is really um, good to actually hear the, the voices not from Western societies, which is very, which I really um, appreciate. Um, my speech today is not going to be very long. I just, just try to, you know, put everything together so you can understand what is happening currently in Armenia. But you know that, um, I don't know how many of you know about Armenia, but I live in Armenia in the South Caucasus most of my life. And most of my life uh, is associated with wars, conflicts, neighbors, enemies, you know, suffering and so on. Um, I'm honestly tired of being invisible and, you know, neglected and not worthy of uh, analysis and, you know, appreciation maybe as well, uh, based on the on, on my given ethnic, you know, identity and geographical locality. And by using this I, um, the pronoun I, um, I'm also referring to all my fellow activists and researchers and feminists in Armenia. Uh, as Julia mentioned already, 10 years ago, 10, 10 days ago, uh, a war started on the borders of Armenia and Azerbaijan, and many people are killed. There is a very fragile ceasefire right now. And um, when you when you hear my voice is trembling, it's not because I'm not prepared for this talk, but because it's really hard to, uh, you know, talk from this position right now. Uh, so excuse me for that. Um, this couple of days ago, we just woke up to a new reality in case where there were where there were very significant, you know, changes and very significant steps towards um, regional uh, peace. And um, you know, the, it's it's also very um, it's it's unbelievable how international media is neglecting the situation in here and presenting it like these two countries are fighting again. Although this time it was actually not over a disputed, so-called disputed territory, but in fact it was the sovereign uh, Azerbaijan and sovereign Armenia as, as two different countries. Um, uh, there are horrible footages of raped and mutilated female soldiers from Armenia and the rhetoric of neighboring uh, countries, uh, governments specifically, is typically genocidal. Now, when I actually um, said what I what I wanted to say, uh, and it's unfortunate that I that I have to say all these things, I will go ahead and discuss what I have to say during this specific discussion. Um, I'm grateful again to the organizers for inviting me and also making my voice and the context I'm, I am coming from heard during this public event. Um, honestly, when when asked. Um, I always say that I'm not particularly studying the actual anti-genderism and its manifestations. I do not specifically think that this is it is different from context to context, and I think there is much to read about anti-genderism already. Um, all the Western scholars have done this immense work about it, which I'm grateful for. What I see from my, my research, my specific research point of view, is that anti-genderism uh, and far-right anti-feminist rhetorics are used in different ways and for different purposes in different contexts, timeframes, and political settings. There is an agreement, that, um, you know, among local researchers and, and scholars here in Armenia that this topic that uh, basically anti-gender attacks in Armenia have started around 2012 and 2013 after a diversity march that has been organized by, uh, you know, both nationalist and LGBT 
Q plus um, community. After which uh, there was a um, when when the rainbow flag was shown during the you know this diversity march, uh, a group of nationalist um, men attacked the group that were holding the, the the flag, and they started to burn and also the burn burn the flag and also beat the 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 protest the participants of the march. Um, all. Um, it, this 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 also happened. Anti gender and so called anti gender attacks also happened um, uh, after Armenia's association with the Eurasian Union and the adoption of the law on gender equality. It can be also discussed that it has started even earlier, maybe. But we agreed that it's actually starting from 2012. So we agreed at least on something. So let's get on from here. The specifics of anti-genderism and far-right rhetoric, rhetoric in Armenia before and after 2018 are different. This is a really remarkable year for Armenia. They are different, especially from the perspective of direction and target of anti-gender attacks. 2018 is a remarkable year for the country. It is the year when the recent power transition happened and a revolution was unprecedented for Armenia, a country willing to go towards democracy and, you know, all this peace agenda, etc., etc. Before 2018, anti-gender uh, rhetoric was the main tool of the oligarchic, corrupt, nationalist and militarist government to manipulate civil society actors, as well as laws and policies regarding gender, sexuality, uh, women's rights. Um, you know, um, typically the agenda very much promoted also by, um, by the EU. For instance, the laws on gender equality in 2013, domestic violence law in 2017, and also signing, uh, yet only signing, not ratification of Istanbul Convention in 2018, beginning of 2018. After 2018, not surprisingly, the rhetoric flipped since the government has changed. Some people who were on the side of gender equality and human rights political agenda became part of the new government so-called new government. Some of them were, were and are vocal about the importance of gender sensitive policies and laws. So the direction of anti-gender attacks somehow went from uh, conservative government to progressive society, to anti-gender groups, to government and their supporters. So it's kind of flipped, the direction is flipped. From 2018 to 2020, only some groups were active in condemning the gender and sexuality topics. These groups self-proclaimed themselves as the new you know, civil society and started to target Open Society Foundation's office openly, more openly in Yerevan and many other queer personal and public events and initiatives, um, some of them really horrible um, and which unfortunately did not receive uh, proper attention by the local authorities. Uh, they were even attacking personal gatherings of queer people in their houses uh, in one of the regions in Armenia. Um, here, um, I have to mention one very important thing, that the members of the, the so-called new government were and are um, are not are not necessarily progressive in their thinking and approaches um, to policy development. Unfortunately, many of them also even now use anti-gender and anti-human rights rhetoric, uh, can also deny the existence of different types of violence and harassment against women and LGBTQ plus people. After 2020 war in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, uh, after the war actually st stopped with an agreement, many former political groups and parties activated their manipulative discourses around gender, peace, war, and militarism again. So the pot that we were all mixing in became even bigger and more chaotic, I would say. Uh, we gained a new opposition, which is basically the former governments, uh, which was silent which were silent before the war, then started political instability in Armenia. And I'm talking about, you know, one to two years. It's like it's happening so, so fast and the things are changing so fast that you can you cannot even catch catch up with them. Um, and then this uh, political instability started in Armenia, which ended up with new elections and re-elected government. But um, re-elected government is basically the same political party that we had from 2018. During this period, 
before, uh, during the election and post elections in 2021, the main rhetoric of the opposition was interlinked with security, political stability, and that the leading party that kind of lost the war is destroying Armenia. Same as in, you know, this anti-gender rhetoric, of course, uh, based on that as well. Once again, during this period, women human rights defenders in Armenia have been the target of anti-gender groups. They were accused of supporting the peace agenda of this, you know, destroyer government with their feminism and human rights. Um, uh, after the elections, when some oppositional rallies started in Yerevan mostly, we have witnessed what I call, uh, I don't know if uh, I am inventing this name or not, but uh, probably not, but luxury activism. Um, imagine people protesting wars and security of a country, a protest for survival, but they have, you know, but in Rolex, Armani, Valentino, Louis Vuitton clothing and accessories, you know, with huge jeeps that they used to come to this protest and then leave at night. You know, they are using terms like resistance, survival, discrimination, and many other terms which are used by feminist and human rights activists. What we see here is what the researchers in Western Europe talk about right now, shifts of the discourses, co-optation of the narratives and terminology, some kind of uh, flip in the discourses where far right, conservative and um, fascist ideology at once is being described with terms of human rights, inclusivity and acceptance. Sorry. <laughs> Um, just a few remarks, like this is a new, these are actually new remarks uh, about this luxury activism. For the moment, this type of activism in Armenia is triple fold. Um, first, there is this group of immensely rich people, mostly former government representatives that own businesses all over Armenia. Second, there is the group of people with absolutely zero wealth whatsoever. Most of them, them can be considered even poor and dependent on very little incomes but they are you know, linked with each other because they are dependent on each other, these two groups. And third, there is the group of people not necessarily openly identified, but within, the, within this group, within this oppositional group that organize women's and mothers' marches in the name of resistance and survival of the nation. Unfortunately, given the situation nowadays, and you know the, this um, also regrettably, the situation with the, uh, the, with the war, with this, you know, again and again, this um, genocidal rhetoric, um, these narratives and co-opted versions of women's marches and other related activities are gaining more and more popularity and taking too much space in the discourses around human rights, acceptance, and solidarity. This is really unfortunate. Uh, I, I, I can only predict, what, but this is my anticipation, that soon there might be legal changes on abortion bans as well. I'm not sure about that, but we can see it because of the war, especially, and restrict, restrictive mechanisms for women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, especially after that, you know, this younger generation is completely exterminated by, by war. This is really the word to, um, I guess, describe the situation. Uh, along all these issues, um, you know, um, uh, around anti-gender rhetoric. This rhetoric is also connected to other societal processes, such as vaccination, um, and not, not only COVID-19 vaccination. It's not only this, you know, this nonsensical ideas that uh, you know, um, you, you take a shot of COVID vaccine and then you become gay or something. There is also, and this is, this is coming from, year, this is already for years now, um, there is this vaccine called Gardasil, which is against cervical cancer among women, uh, which is um, um, preventing girls to get affected by human papillomavirus. And there was this, you know, anti-vax and anti-gender uh, campaigns kind of mixed when there was this idea to promote vaccination with Gardasil among young girls. Um, this is also something that, you know, women, they are destroying the Armenian women, their um, uh, body and, and, and everything. There is also, of course, militarism and anti peace This is for sure. And this is for years already now, again, because uh, with the previous government, what we had, 
we had this ideology of uh, nation and army that are intertwined, you know, you are a nation and you are an army and you have to learn militarism. They were even going to push um, ag agenda and educational programs in schools about militarism and related issues. Also universities are, also, are pretty much uh, militarized and also, you know, this fear you know using this fear again and again among the uh, among the people that uh genocide is what really connects us with the western and eastern neighbors and that's it this is also some rhetoric that is intertwined with the gender um so-called gender uh agenda uh in armenia and also uh and i think i will sum up with all uh, with, with this with this uh, couple of words anti-gender rhetoric is also connected to uh deeply racist violent and also hate-based rhetoric um in, in general i think i will stop here because um um and and i'm sorry i was using my notes because it's really hard to concentrate to be honest um I hope it was something that uh, you know was interesting to hear, and we will have a quite have a, we will have questions and, and a good discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Siren.